Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly or holler at us on Substack. That's oxum.substack.com and patreon.com slash oxum. Today's special guest is Noah. Is it cumin or how do how do you pronounce that? You got it. First time. Cumin like the spice. That's that's why I know about it. It's yeah. a it's a very prominent, uh, spelled with a C, if, if there's any relation, a very prominent part of my favorite passage in the New Testament in Matthew 23. It talks about people who uh, tithe or give up even 10% of their cumin spice, but uh, they weren't doing some other things. I've got to pitch around a deep dive into cumin to various publications because, yeah, cumin, cumin is a special thing. Cumin has been used as currency in the past. Absolutely. The in the Bitcoin standard. Um, I always assumed that my last name, it was like a misspelling from Kuzmin, which is quite a common Russian name. But it turns out, no, my people were spice merchants. They were. Oh, no way. We landed to Europe. Yeah. That's, that's so that's, awesome. That's the tale. Yeah. In Ethiopia, as late as the late 1800s, we had salt as a, as a currency. And so, yeah, hundred percent cumin. I would prefer cumin as a currency over fiat any day of the week. <laughs> One of my professors used to say seven days a week and twice on Sunday. So I'll, uh, if you can bring that back, you know, make human great again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I have uh, a ton that I'd love to uh, talk to you about, but I think an interesting place to start would be uh, Urbit. I will confess at the front end that I probably haven't booted up in about a year, year and a half. And so mm -hmm. part of this will be some nice admonition against me, but part of it will be brand new. I've, I've actually had a couple of people who are, uh, Urbit contributors on the program before, but could you make a pitch for people who have no idea what Urbit is and why you're kind of interested in using it? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny to hear you mention that about um, it having been a year. I was thinking about this recently and Urbit, it's like you're building the Duomo in Milan. You know, you're trying to build the most beautiful uh stable thing possible only in this case it's software and not uh physical architecture but you know you want people to come to uh you know to come to church in the process that it's being built right mm -hmm. so you run into all these problems which is people you know you know people come in and they're like oh this isn't the duomo of milan right like um He's like, well, no, it's not, because that takes quite a long time. But in the meantime, uh, you know, there's you know, maybe, you know, maybe you can check out the nave. You know, there's, there's cool stuff to be doing on it. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I've been using Urbit consistently for three years now. Nice. Um, Urbit is a new, it's a, you can think of it as a new internet. I don't know how technical your audience is, mm -hmm. but the idea is that, um, for various reasons, the the software that we use and that we commonly pre refer to as you know the internet, which is actually a, a stack of a whole bunch of different things, um, is deteriorating, and and it's not going well. And one very acute way we can see this, I think, is like the absolute flood of shite that's going to come with the advent of LLMs. Right. Yeah. It used to be you could Google search something and, you know, kind of rely on on that to get relevant info for you. Right. But now that's being gamed because people know how to game the SEO and they know how to, um, you know, uh, follow their own incentives, but not worry about your incentives. So Urban is attempt to re redo it from scratch, to reintroduce some magic. And moreover, from a technical perspective, to build a system that will last. And so what does that mean? Like, why would it last? And, you know, the stack that we have currently not last? Well, you'll notice like all of your software is constantly updating. Um, this makes it, you know, break in its usage with other software. Urbit is built to eventually be frozen so that it will never, ever update again. And so Amazing. The, term, the term they use is Kelvin versioning, right? So you're versioning downwards instead of upwards. You're versioning to absolute Kelvin zero. Um, 
you know, that it's it's something uh, one can talk about endlessly because the more you learn about it, the more um, the more there is to talk about. But but that's a short version. No, that's really good. And I think an adjacent movement is the kind of light phone. And with both, I think the idea is about rendering control back to you as a practicer of uh, or player in jujitsu. I love, you know, mm. one of my favorite coaches refers to jujitsu as the science of control. And um, my father grew up, I didn't have the exact position as him, but he grew up like really imputing into me his aesthetic pleasure gained from manual or stick shift driving over automatic because of the control rendered and i would see him do that both in the united states and when we'd go back to visit ethiopia where there were far more stick shift vehicles but yeah. sometimes like whenever he would rent a car he would specifically request to the stick shift one which i thought was weird and i didn't see other people doing but it all comes back to this idea of control and what I, I know I've just implemented in my own life to make something real practical to the least technical people. I think there are a lot of non-technical people in my audience, but there's a irate minority who are quite technical, um, probably yeah. way more tech savvy than even I am. And um, one of the things that I've implemented, I think just kind of soft influenced by the, the whole urban atmosphere is that I've turned like all notifications off. On yeah, my phone. you got it, you got it. <laughs> it seems I, I, basic. I try to even turn off like messages and phone and I'll be like, you know, we'll talk on the phone when I'm ready to talk on the phone. But that's, yeah. that's, that's a little bit much. So I've had to turn it bothers some people. It bothers yeah. some people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> I could say I've gotten um, my life back. Yeah, I, I love it. I think if I had to diagnose myself, why I've been distant is um, I just didn't know as many people IRL who were using mm -hmm. it. And so mm -hmm. I think with greater adoption, I'll come back to it. But even the other day, um, now it might be months ago, someone was talking to me or talking online and I was uh, lurking and watching them talk about like chess on Urbit. And I was like, okay, that that might bring me back ASAP. Uh, and I know some player? other things. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm a big chess player. Oh, I'm not nice. like super ranked or anything, but- what, um, What's your rating? Above average. I have I have no idea. That's what I'm saying. Like I have a chess.com account. It might be 1300 or something, okay, okay. but I have no, awesome. I don't use it enough. I remember um, I used to be an organizational ombudsman and uh, I was based in North Dakota, but I knew a guy who had the same position at UCLA and we would just like, I played this one dude and then my other guy who was a best friend. I used to play these two people like every day <laughs> for years, just like those two, because for me, a part of chess playing is like shit talking. So right. I, I uh, you know, I hate the sort of like the quiet. I, I need to like call the person as well yeah. or, or get a video chat going like we, we have. Are you a chess player? Yeah, yeah. I also love chess. I'm also not like, you know, uh, you know, approaching a title anytime soon. But uh, I love to play. And I'm glad you said you love ch shit talking. You know, I'm a coastal elite over here in New York City. And I'm just a, a short walk away from Washington Square where you can sit down with the chess hustlers and uh and really chop it up and the uh, first time i was humbled i was eighth grade in new york city grand central park i had never played timed chess and a bum played mm. me like i think it was blitz it was like five minutes or something and he whooped my ass after that in high school i did get used to timed chess so i feel like i would have done better in high school but in eighth grade man he took my money too i guess i gave him some money he hustled me as a, as a 13 year old <laughs> There's a great video. A grandmaster goes undercover to play chess hustlers in New York City. His name is Maurice Ashley. And of course, he's beating the crap out of this guy because, like, okay, the chess hustlers are good, but they're not grandmaster good. Yeah. And the guy does something amazing. He does like a magic trick where he like takes two of Maurice Ashley's knights with one move. Wow. And the guy's like, hey, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, that's that's they're not messing around. They want that five dollars, uh, and they deserve it most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you used the chess function on Urbit yet, or no? Yeah, I have. It's been a while. It's been like yeah. a year. I had some slow games going. I think yeah, yeah the new version of chess is going to have speed chess, which is pretty much all I play these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our ADD world. So I just play Blitz. Um, but yeah, I've played chess on Urbit. Had a couple good games going. And um, what you said about the stick shift, like that's a hundred percent speaking our language. In fact, that was, um, you know, one of the marketing lines that was used at one point was like, you know, 
it, using Urbit should be like, uh, you know, driving a car that you know how to repair yourself and, you know, where you know how it works and it's yours. And, um, and that's the other element I didn't touch on, but uh, Urbit in its reinvention of the uh, computing stack is really a return to how the internet was uh, back in its early days, which was a peer-to-peer -peer network, which is to say that, um, you know, when you send me a message on Twitter, it's not going directly from you to me, right? Mm -hmm. It's going into a big database um, run by Twitter, and then that is just being like reflected down to me. Um, but in the early days of the internet, when you sent me a message, it would be straight from you to me. When we interacted at all, it would be straight from your computer to my computer. So Urbit is imagining a world where like everything you use is something um, you know, you're gonna have personal ownership of. Whereas the way we use software now, it's very much like we're just kind of wandering through a big mall where everything looks the same. And then like suddenly like they'll take one store away or suddenly they'll prevent us from you, you know, entering one store. Um, so, so yeah, that's the other element of it. That's kind of worth touching on. Yeah. And I think that's very important right now. Um, maybe, maybe also part of this lull is that we have the, uh, a couple of benevolent dictatorships, right? And I'm not talking yeah. about Bukele and them, but I'm talking about uh, Elon Musk on X and then um, Hamish McKenzie and Chris Best on Substack, where at their whims and caprices, right now we have not the total idealized world of what Urbit is, but something kind of approaching it. It reminds me, um, you're, you're in New York City, Curtis Yarvin, the founder of Urbit once uh, recently was saying that there are only real two cities in America, which is my city, LA, and your city, New York. <laughs> Controversial for uh, the rest of the folks in DC, New York, San Fran, Austin, and wherever else they are. I would are. add maybe Miami. I see maybe Miami, I okay, give, on the come I up. give Miami, you know, Miami is unique, so I might grant it the title of city. It is, it, it is, it's, it's so interesting um how latin american dominant uh miami is too i've only ever flown out of there um never stayed there properly so i'd have to give it a a new visit um do they still have the bitcoin mayor they do suarez yeah, yeah. last time i checked he's still there yeah okay okay that's cool so yeah, yeah that's uh yeah it's it's up and coming for sure but like la and new york are on that tokyo london level yeah. um and what what's interesting about that is because of these benevolent dictatorships on X and Substack, we haven't maybe felt the the right amount of persecution and need. Maybe if everyone was more persecuted, like we didn't have Substack, we didn't have X, maybe the urban boom would happen um, quicker. Some certain like nascent movements uh, are best when they are in persecution counterintuitively. So I'm wondering if if that's uh, what it is. But that total control means that you don't have to re rely on any benevolent dictator like you you just rely on yourself and the peer networks that you form so that that's really cool and did you um you have obviously this project the mars review yes. right can you talk about it and did you form that idea prior to playing with urbit or after after um and it really came out of my experiences with urbit directly um I was sort of looking for the next thing to do. I was talking with a lot of Urbit people. I think somebody had introduced the idea of the Mars review of books as a joke. You know, I, I think you might be enough of an old head to know that Mars is like an Urbit term. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is it no right. longer in use? Yeah, I, I, I got it. No, that. it absolutely is. It yeah. absolutely is. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so the first Along with paper, all the planets and galaxies and yeah, stars, yeah, which yeah, is the yeah, other yeah. lingo. Yeah, so the first paper Curtis, or the first blog Curtis wrote about Urbit, he used um, this conceit that he had traveled to Mars and the Martians were a very advanced civilization and uh, being advanced, they're also very generous. And so they uh, revealed to him the perfect uh, version of software. And so he merely recorded that and brought it down to earth. Um, so 
I, lo I like that conceit a lot, you know, ima imagine what something would look like if it had been perfected. So I sort of use that to think about the idea of a book review. Um, I have a publishing background, like writing and publishing. Um, and I just absolutely loved reading the New York Review of Books as a kid. Um, I kind of, I always say I sort of gave myself a general education that way. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a good general education is hard to find. And um, that was one place where I could be like, oh, like, who is this guy like Pessoa? And then you just type it in and I just had the full archive um, at university. And just having this place where you know the standard is going to be very high. And um, it's as though all the world's information is contained in there. Now, of course, you know, there are many imperfections of the New York Review of Books then, and there are many imperfections now. So I thought, well, okay, what, you know, how do we make a more perfect book review, like a more perfect union? And my thesis was that there are some immensely uh, talented, eloquent writers uh, working in what we could call the prestige world of prestige mm -hmm. publications, New York or Atlantic, Harper's New York Review of Books, who were feeling perhaps a little bit constrained um, about what they were able to say in those publications. You know, this was launched, you know, still during COVID. Um, and perhaps they might want an outlet um, where they would be less constrained. And then on the other hand, um, there were some brilliant people in the online world on Twitter on podcasts who who were kind of better able to synthesize ideas because they weren't um locking themselves into only like getting their information from particular places but they didn't have the incentive to write their ideas down carefully right so you know you you write in tweets or you know you do podcasts um but these weren't um media that were sort of meant to last um and we're already seeing with like uh vice being you know all, all of a sudden all, right. all, all this stuff is just like disappearing and it could absolutely happen and yeah and so like now twitter's kind of different right because it's like oh you can write long form on twitter but it's like we forget like this stuff doesn't belong to us we don't own it uh you know elon sells like it's all gone potentially right it's like it just True. lives on somebody's database and that costs money to uh maintain whereas if you print it out at the very least you know you own it uh if you purchase it and um and there's a similar ethos at play with urbit which is you know one of the things people will say is it's the 100 year computer right the idea is to build it such that like you know you can shut it down right now and then your grandchildren 80 years from now can boot it back up and it'll work exactly the same way. That's clearly not true of any other software project. Um, so again, so that's the, that, that's, you know, that's an aim and that's a, it's a very ambitious aim. So it's, it's in the process of being um, brought to fruition. But so, 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 so that's, that's where Mars uh, came into play for the title and, and the project got started. Yeah. Really just out of, wanting to see if I could integrate my uh, literary past with my urbit present. That's beautiful. Um, when I was more of a theory cell, I was really interested in some of the literature coming out of the Center for a Stateless Society, and they pushed me toward this guy, um, Benjamin Tucker, who was one of the individualist anarchists, and he had these four great monopolies he used to always hark against. One of them was copyright. And through him and other people who came later, including trademark and patent, uh, who came later, they kind of showed the nefarious way in which so many objects today would all be designed with this hundred year aim in mind that you're talking about. 
um, were it not for the cheap bucks that they make? Like, why is it that car parts and phone parts are not all compatible? Like that lack of compatibility and the kind of closed circuit of Apple is all tied together with this idea of copyright, trademark, and patent that without which people could still make money, but it would be in a different way and the the material goods would, would last much longer. Maybe not 100 years, but at least like trending towards that that aim that you're saying. So that's that's an amazing uh, goal that you have. And so was there a plan to have it ever just exclusively on Mars, on Urbit? Um, and, and talk to me about that, because the print edition is very interesting too, about the idea of having it print and then releasing it to, I don't know what the name for uh, the, the real world is. <laughs> Earth. Or the non-Earth. You, you say Mars and Earth, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like digital, digital Earth yeah. as opposed to print Earth. Yeah. So, right. So, yes, initially when I launched it, it was only available on Urbit and in print. Um, and then at the same time, there was a company that was like projecting from Earth, from Mars onto Earth. So I had it hosted on, on Mars and then it would be viewable on Earth. Um, so it's still available on Urbit. It's still available on print. We now also have a digital Earth um, version, uh, and that's if you want to. If you don't want the print version, but you still want to read the articles, that's the place to subscribe now. MarsReview.org, and um, we use a software platform you may have heard of called Substack. Um, and so, <laughs> but Good and stuff. so, yeah. So, but there's going to be very interesting things about um what people who are on urbit and want to read the mars review there are going to be able to do and i'm still sort of like um figuring that out but and i'm not i'm not sure all of what i'm uh at liberty to to talk about but like, but you know i th there's definitely going to be some like bitcoin integrations happening on urbit and like you know the the other dream of this like peer-to-peer -peer operating system is that like you know you have your twitter followers but those don't have you know there's no way you can integrate that into like you know roblox i don't know if you play roblox i've never played roblox but like I have. You, know, you can imagine a world where all of your data that you've accrued online all of your followers your payments all of this is purely yours and with something like bitcoin like pay, you know payments can 100 percent be that as well so it's like oh i want to like you know invite all of my twitter followers into my roblox world they can pay for the mars review within the roblox world with bitcoin and you just have this completely sovereign computing stack where everything can integrate with uh everything else so so that's 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 the dream of, of the mars review is that soon it'll be able to integrate into sort of other really exciting stuff that's happening on urbit so um you know it's still there you can still join the urbit group but you know uh just for a couple technical reasons we had to we had to get it onto to substack to sort of make it a little easier for the time being for people to be able to subscribe to the digital edition yeah fair enough i remember i had my um my own woes when first launching. I first launched through Port, and I think wow. I'm a part of that uh, group. And I remember having to get like a a new wall. Like I had some one of the um, exchanges. I also had like a separate wallet, but I had to like create a new wallet because I never had had Ethereum before. Right. And I remember right. I had to get right. it, it like I think maybe even through Mozilla Fox. Like I don't know. It was a weird. Right. I, I remember doing it, and then I remembered I got like uh, hit with gas surges yeah. too while right. i was doing it and it was just like I, but right. i was so determined like right i was prior to using like a pc and i bought like a mac just to make it like easier for me to get on urban so like i was kind of committed to at least um tasting and and then playing and so i'm it's a it's a great mercy that you've allowed people on earth to to kind yeah. of taste it but you still are going to have uh, greater perks that fair enough you don't have to say all now yeah. for those who are willing to travel that that great distance and voyage to mars yeah yeah um, exactly. 
you you also um had this great meetup in um in Lisboa or Lisbon in Portugal yes. and uh you guys discussed this uh title that you came up with canceling the cancel culture i love also that you had an ex post facto explanation for that because sometimes the muse brings you a title but not <laughs> yeah, the interpretation exactly. exactly so could you could you talk about that because you mentioned it slightly in terms of during um the pandemic or the pandulce phenomenon uh when people were from prestige presses and media maybe deciding to reach out to other outlets and then also you were uh, converting the internet artists into great writers online as well <laughs> yeah i mean my ex post facto explanation for that phrase is like i mean the culture industry really is an industry um it works according to various laws um that you know at various times depending on where you were um you know it could work out for you pretty well um but uh at other times and in other places it certainly wouldn't i remember being uh, very moved when i was reading this book um how the internet happened and um uh they were quoting mark andreessen right and he he's saying um people were asking him like oh don't you think like amazon is so terrible because it's uh it's killing all these independent bookstores he said listen i grew up in rural wisconsin we didn't have independent bookstores there was no interest in you know providing great books to the people of my town the the idea is you know we could go you know pound sand i think is the phrase he used and 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 that was the end of it so um you know that's just that's just an example of like it's easy to feel nostalgic about some of the better parts of of um the culture industry as it were um but there were you know <laughs> it 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 had to it had to fall and and so you know what what replaced so you know i guess i should define the culture industry right which is like um the way that money trickles down into actually you know creative people right um and so i think that's being replaced by something called the 1000 true fans model um and i don't know if you've heard that phrase before but you know you're a i haven't but i think i readily understand it yeah you get it you get you get it immediately yeah. because you're a podcaster and you're a writer and and uh, so you know this was formulated very early i don't know like 10 15 years ago is this guy i think kevin kelly was his name and you know you can you can figure it out his point was like hey like in the future you're not going to need to get like a 1 million dollar book deal um you're not going to have to sell your book to a million people if you have a thousand real fans who will pay five dollars a month for what you offer uh you know that's a living yeah so so i think you know it's it's incumbent on us to to move into that model as um you know in the best way possible and i think so what you know what we wanted to talk about on that panel was like well uh you know <laughs> how is this going to work in the future are there still going to be patronage models um you know and, and nobody knows exactly but but it's, it's it's just fun it's fun to think about because you know it, we still don't realize just how much like the internet has changed things you know it's it's weird when you think about it. like anybody anywhere in the world can just like send you an arbitrary amount of money at any time that's like a really different paradigm for um for earning money um you know I, there's still there's still some problems um i mean i don't know i how, how do you how do you how do you think about like um the the shift were you were you ever aiming to like get a big book deal or to to star in films or to, <laughs> to, to, yeah. to do any of these things that were the dreams of um it's a very funny question <clears throat> um 
I got into acting very briefly. Really? Not for any desire or dream of acting, <laughs> which is totally different. Um, I'm in Hollywood, and my best friend lived with an actor who came here from Kansas. Yeah. And I was just a guy trying to make a quick book. So I was in my undergrad at the same time I was working for the United States Census Bureau, 2010, knocking on people's doors who didn't comply and asking them to comply or they'll be fined. And if not jailed and killed and all that good stuff. <laughs> and uh, his roommate was like, dude, you look like you could be an actor. Why don't you try? And I go in as an extra on this uh, music video. I don't know if you ever heard of Chromio. Did you ever heard them? They'd be very funny now. I'd never checked in with them. It's basically a Jewish guy and a Muslim guy, and they got a band. Mm -hmm. And I was similar height to the Jewish guy who's quite tall. And so they said they upgraded me from extra to stand in. And mm -hmm. people made a big deal of it because it was like one of my first sets. And I'm still in that music video. I signed away my royalties, so I don't get royalties for it. And they've got millions of views on YouTube. It's called Don't Turn the Lights On, in case anyone wants to go check me out. I'm in there like five <laughs> to seven times in upside down and this way and in Hawaiian shirts and playing guitar and all sorts of other weird things, um, really just like blinking in and out. Um, but everyone around me there kind of came with that dream to make it big in yeah. film. And I was always the guy who was just super high in trait openness and so down and willing if that yeah. happened but that was not my dream i was in there for that quick payday and out and i signed away my royalties <laughs> and so i could say for film wise never closest to a book deal I've, I've made a couple offers to um kind of small publishers i know i've never reached out to a major publisher with ideas just potentially and um i've always kind of hated the rigmarole and bureaucracy and politics behind the scenes yeah and so i don't want to beg and when the means of production here were democratized and we had this greater access to patronage that you're talking about yeah i said i can kind of sell this myself and yeah. I, i've heard from michael malice who's a, a person in publishing i respect who's oh, yeah. who's done like huge books in the prestige publishing world but then also independently published that any small press wouldn't be worth it unless you know about that guaranteed patronage you're going to get from books sold otherwise you might as well go independent or go all the way big by locking in a deal with a big company but all his latest books have been yeah, self-published if you know yeah 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 yeah, I think I've heard of him talk about that as well. I think, um, and that actually, it might have been uh, Mr. Malice who sort of changed my thinking around it. Um, That's cool. I, I, what, I, that might have been with Curtis, actually, where, where I heard him talk about that. I don't remember. Um, he, I, I think he's talked about it a lot of different yeah, times. Yeah. Um, I'm forgetting who it was, but they're one of these pickup artist playboy guys who made like a very big shift. And I remember specifically a conversation he had. I forgot the guy's mm. name, sorry. But I remember a specific conversation he had with that guy that went in depth about the publishing industry. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, I mean, having worked at a small press, um, you know, if you're trying to make money, I think you, these days, unless you get a really big book deal, yeah, it's, it's, it's likely wise to self-publish if you have a platform. I mean, yes. that's really the that's, that's a big if that's the big if and that's actually you know it's not all roses this um this new world i mean i've been uh, i've been thinking about this um you know art is uh inefficient like it's inefficient by nature and i think it has this in common with religion because it it's uh you could say it descends from religion or it um or it's uh one might even say it's another form of it but um you know ev everything in this new world is about being hyper efficient and that's what gaining a big audience is about and i think that's the i still much as i like respect people who have political opinions that they never could have expressed in any other way had there not been Twitter, I still can't help but feel that the incentives to get big on Twitter in order to um, 
in order to be able to write, in order to be able to make a film, like these are not good incentives Agreed. because you, you end up being, a, you know, a Pussy. publicist, you know, who's an artist on, on the side or a writer on the side. And there's some like great, great people. And, you know, I don't know what, I think it just takes maybe a level of autism that I just, you know, can't access, but like who are able to, you know, be great, great publicists of themselves while continuing to turn out a, a great product. But I think most people who are, who could be brilliant artists or could be brilliant writers, they don't have that gene, you know, to be great self publicists. So, you know, when we're, while we're canceling the culture industry, I do think we should, uh, yeah, we should really think and talk a lot about patronage. Of course, you know, if you're, if you have a huge audience on Twitter, it's sort of the same, you're, it's still patronage, right? It's just patronage from the masses. And I think that's, you know, that's quite dangerous. Um, because, you know, we can only see how it's going to hypertrophy and get worse and worse. And um, like, uh, we're going to have to do more and more outrageous things to get attention. We're going to have to um, produce clickbait at ever higher and higher rates. Uh, I, I don't think this, this will be a healthy situation for the arts. I don't have personally a solution, but you know, one thing we can hope for is that um, people who uh, have different tastes from the current culture industry, who have done very well for themselves, you know, uh, they'll they'll continue to care about like a thriving society in in all all facets, which is you know not just um, um, investing in in tech startups. You know, it's it's uh, what the Medici's used to do. It's it's all sorts of things. So, Absolutely, it's the humanities in the arts. I agree with a lot of the kind of, um, I don't know, Chris Rufo and other kind of views of the world of just butchering the universities of the humanities mm -hmm. and arts. But that doesn't mean I don't want them to be funded. I want them to be funded in these ways that we're talking about in these patronage um, networks. I actually, uh, I had an article some time ago. Um, that I put together two people that I think aren't all often put together that I'll, I'll read their quotes for you briefly. One is John Adams. The other is Margaret Mead. Okay. Uh, very different people, right? Yeah, John sure. Adams says it does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. And of course, Curtis talks about how him and his boys uh, ran a little right wing coup there after the articles of <laughs> confederation broke down. Margaret Mead, a little bit different in political persuasion, but agrees. They're basically both elite theorists that match the Ita Italian school of political science there. She says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so I think it goes to this point, whether it's the masses or certain um, new elites rising that have spare change that understand the importance of the arts and i've seen that you know you, you were on the same panel as lomez and lomez has certainly been in a lot of conversations lately about trying to convince like trademark conserve big c conservatism to invest in the arts more because they just ended up being um lamer than usual that's why i'm, I'm really interested that you um had been following uh um mark andreessen and, and he's been really pleasantly surprising me the whole effective accelerationism movement, which I think was a kind of a, a jab at effective <laughs> altruism, yeah, and how positive, how positive their outlook is on technology and what that is allowing us to do. It takes me back to someone I read many moons ago in the Austrian School of Economics, Joseph Schumpeter. He called this process that you talk about creative destruction. Mm -hmm. You know, the funniest thing ever the phenomenon i don't know if you guys have them in new york i imagine you do is the the wiping out of independent bookstores you talk about by amazon what is amazon's latest move they make physical bookstores yeah 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 That's we, amazing I, we, yeah i i went into one um it's a, not a bad store it's up at columbus circle uh somebody i read somewhere that 
the actually the Galaxy brand play on that, the reason Amazon is doing it that is that they um it's like their way of um it's like an alpha release for stores we're starting to see more of, which is like where they can track you very carefully and like so <laughs> and like and, and know your exact like pattern as you browse. Yeah. For them to like better optimize and like take over like all physical stores. And you know, they're like trying out these stores where like you don't you don't actually pay, right? It's just like yeah, I, I don't know whether I don't know what actually gets charged. Like maybe if you have an Amazon credit card, it just gets charged when you walk out the door or something like that. They so better they pay for security because I have been seeing in California, I don't know if New York <laughs> is as bad, but you know, they have these like I think they call them like flash mobs where they come in, especially targeting at Target, Costco, Walmart, mm -hmm. the self checkout lane. And so like mm -hmm. there's a local uh, Walmart in the Va San Fernando Valley where I grew up. They just closed down. They taped down all of their self checkout lanes recently because mm -hmm. of that. So Amazon yeah. better be having some nice private police with that, too. Otherwise, right. I wonder how that's <laughs> right, going to work. Right, right. Yeah. But it sounds very yeah. Westworld. Did you watch uh, HBO's Westworld, the way you described it? I think I watched the first episode, but I'm, I'm not very familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, without spoiling it, one of the kind of they have uh, a theme park uh, where you come in and have this like simula uh, simulation that seems very real. And one of the things people don't understand is is exactly what you described. It's like there's an ulterior galaxy brand motive yes. behind behind why you're given so much access and allowed so much pleasure. Right. Uh, well, that's a very good uh, metaphor for so many things in our lives, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> on your um, uh, on your series, I see you have another uh, mutual of mine uh, besides uh, Andreessen. He's more on and off. Is uh, Pablo Panish? I actually saw him at the recent uh, debate with Richard Hananiah, who I had on the well, program recently against well, Jeremy. See, this is what I was going to say. Uh, I'm really sad we didn't get to meet up. I was in LA. Oh no way! Yeah, I came, you know, to piggyback off of that, and we did a little Mars review event the night after. We had delicious tacos, and you know, I spoke yeah. to DT, and he yeah. had told me there was an event soon. I didn't know until I got home that soon meant the next day, and I <laughs> I found out really about it too late. Really, he, he said soon, and I thought he meant like in a month or something. But the thing was, I was basically violently ill for the entirety of my LA uh, stay. I had just returned from El Salvador and I had always avoided the El Salvador stomach bug in all my previous sojourns, but this time I think it caught up with me. So I didn't even end up going to the debate. I was really uh, worse for the wear and I did make it to my own event because I figured I just kind of have to. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 was I, I came to LA and I just like <laughs> lay in bed in my Airbnb for like four and a half days and then flew back to New York. It was really I'm nice. so it was sorry to first hear that. Time in LA. <laughs> I don't know what type of pupusas you had over there in El Salvador. Oh right? man, this was brutal. <laughs> I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemies. It was, man, it was so tell me about that live event since I missed it and hopefully you do another one that I could pull up on. Yeah, it was great. I mean, yeah, DT is always, you know, an event is as good as your readers if you're doing a literary reading. And we just had three great ones. DT is always um, a pleasure. And then, how, would, uh, how would you describe him for those who don't know uh, Delicious Tacos? I know he's got a, a film coming oh, yeah. out soon. Yeah, well, he's a writer. Uh, he's been writing on the Internet for over 10 years now. Um, you know, I think he writes about uh, sex and love uh, in a way that, like, you couldn't get published with uh, mainstream presses. And he writes uh, very, um, I would say, honestly and elegantly and, um, you know, uh, also at times with great humor and great uh, vulgarity. Yeah, there's... Um... I hadn't thought of it until someone said it, but someone compared him to like a younger Bukowski. And I loved reading Charles Bukowski growing up. And I, after someone said that, that made actually a lot more sense to me than any comparisons to any sort of uh, pickup artists. But mm -hmm. I, like he's an interesting figure to me in that he was MC for that debate because it's such an expressly political event. And a lot yeah. of people in the crowd are so expressly political. But his work, other than 
not having the sort of fingerprints of the zeitgeist in it. Right. Like it's more the absence of the zeitgeist than right. anything expressly uh, political. So it's it's a much more subtle. It's it's for like the people who like Tolkien over C.S. Lewis because it, it just the thing is more subtle. But wh where does that fit? in with like your likes and could you, your magazine, the Marcus Review of Books seems to be similar in that way. You mentioned how there were some maybe different takes on COVID, but hey, like even some major prestige places now are, are having those same hot takes. It's just a, on a little bit of a delay. Yes, yes, yeah. So are you guys expressly political or could you talk about in what ways you're, you're not? Yeah, uh, no, I've never been, uh a politics guy. That was never my aim. That was never something that interested me particularly. I've always been an art and literature guy. Uh, that's what gets me going. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's actually, that's a great um, connection that you made. Um, because, yeah, I like to think that we kind of sidestep uh, culture war stuff. I just personally, don't that's just not how i want to spend my time but by the same token like you know we're we're not gonna we're not gonna operate on the system where like there are certain things that are uh, verboten right so you know of course it's just a reflection of my own taste so maybe some things i'm not interested in or you know what have you um and you know any failings on that front can be traced directly back to me. But yeah, I think it's, it's much more, you know, it's like, I just, it goes back to the Mars thing. I was like, oh, what would a book review be like? Oh, if we just like pretended like all this shit didn't exist, you know what I mean? So like in our first issue, we had a, just a, I'm, I'm, I love it so much, this great piece on COVID by, a uh, gentleman who goes by William Briggs on Twitter. And um, it's true what you say that, you know, gradually mainstream outlets have have shifted, but I love to have this kind of time stamp of like, yes. hey, here's what, here's what, you know, a sane person was thinking about the insanity happening around him at the time. Um, you know, so we can write about controversial things, but, I, I don't want the book review to be politically motivated. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, what, what, what more can I say about that? I just, yeah. Like what would be the aim or motivation then just like right, in, right, in no. general, or is yeah, there any well, way in which you editorially rein people in subject matter wise? That's a good question. I mean, sure. Like I, I I just, I want every piece to be the best version of what it is trying to be. So sometimes maybe that looks like reining in, maybe sometimes that looks like the opposite of reining in. Mm -hmm. um, Telling them to go broader. Or, you know, or like, you know, really sink your teeth in, you know, you don't have to, don't pull punches, you know, it's, it's, it sort of depends. Um, but in terms of what I want it to be, I want it to be a work of art in and of itself. That's really, um, that's really how I think of it. And I don't know whether I succeed or fail at that, but um, you know, it's fun to go back to the New York Review of Books. I was talking to a friend who used to work for Bob Silvers, who was the impresario of the New York Review of Books for forty years. It was his baby. You know, it was, had his stamp on it, and people would always sort of like ask him, how come you don't ever want to write anything? And it's like, he, well, he was like, he produced, you know, like a 40, a 40 year thousand volume um, work of art that was a reflection of like what he had to say about the world. Yeah, like really. his curation, if not direct. Yeah, yeah. So I really wanted to like, just do that and not write but the thing is like to do publicity you have to write on twitter and write blog posts so now i've sort yeah. of keeping that up and okay i'll keep writing no it's it's a really great point and you made that earlier it made me think of i have a really good friend he just uh he's a nasa scientist and decided mm -hmm. on the side to get a master's in theology totally unrelated to his physics work 
and he just wrote a book and he's the, like the least self-promotional guy ever and so even his small publisher which is like this university was wanting him to do all these different publicity events and he was like you know what i'm gonna go on henok's show <laughs> that's it <laughs> he literally just came on my show <laughs> and, and it led to i think some books right. he hasn't told me exactly how many but i'm sure it led to some book sales and that was kind of like as much it's not that he's lazy it's just he's doing all these other things like you right. only have so much energy but you really have to be a media uh, company in this day I, I wonder on this point i saw something really crazy this week uh, which was people have all these synonyms, but like straight up the revolutionary communist party of uh, New York or America was marching this week. And yeah. they had the flags and the signs, the hammer, the sickle, everything. And it seems like to be uh, out of the kind of scene of Jacobin and these other like explicitly communist, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Marxist, Leninist, uh, tanky organizations. Um, have you ever been pitched by someone like that? And I wonder what, uh, like, are you guys at least all anti-communist or that even like the apoliticalness doesn't even like get to that or are they, like they wouldn't want to associate? It's the, the, the last thing you said is, well, actually, it's another good question. It's really, it's just a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's always an intuitive thing. Um, no, I am happy to have people from the left write in the Mars Review of Books, and they have. Um, and, I've, you know, I've published many things, which many pieces, which, you know, if, like, if you put them all together, it would, it would be contradictory, right? And I think that, I think that's, how a magazine should run. There's a great uh, quotation from one of my favorite writers, G.K. Chesterton. Um, and somebody asked him, what's your strategy for um, getting published in the periodicals? And he says, uh, well, you know, I write a, a right-wing essay for the right-wing periodical and a left-wing essay for the left-wing <laughs> periodical, and then I switch the envelopes, right? Because yeah. the idea was then it was like, you know, that 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 was something that um, you know, like the right-wing periodical would want to publish something that would kind of like shock or interest their readers, um, you know, that that would be quite different from what they were expecting. And you know they would accept it because it would be from Chesterton. I think this this facet of of publications has really drifted away for the most part. Um, you still see it now and again, but people have sort of re entrenched. Um, but no, like I published Norman Finkelstein, an excerpt from his book. I saw that with an um, epic picture of him at like the beach or something. Yes, yeah, Amazing. yeah, he's, he's, Amazing. A, he's a hale and hearty man. Um, and uh, he, yeah, he sent me that picture. So j just so people know, I didn't like, you know, do that. Um, <laughs> without, uh, I was so impressed by that. I was yeah. so impressed by that. I've seen him on the debate circuits lately on the Israel-Palestine stuff. Yes, yes. I've I've appreciated, you know, I don't necessarily agree with him yeah. on everything, but like, you know, he's a Maoist. But I've appreciated yeah. listening to him. Like yeah. he's, he's a specimen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in a way, he's a good example because he's somebody who's so obviously a a serious scholar and B operating in good faith, right? And that's all I want from anybody. And so if you, you know. If you, someone sends me like just you know a really elegantly put together, brilliant like and yeah, in a way I would love to have somebody be like, mm, this this is why Lenin was right, you know. Like I would love to have somebody send me that and have it like actually be interesting. Like I would yeah. love, you know what I mean? Like sure, like let let's like let's let's discuss, you know. Yeah, and when I think about it, it's partially um, the people, one of the big culture uh, podcasts over at Substack is the fifth column. If you, I don't know if you ever come across no, them. I'm familiar with it. Um, 
you know, Camille Foster, Matt Welch, and Michael Moynihan, they're all kind of uh, been in journalism space for a while and did their own things, but they come together. It's a really interesting news media, news criticism podcast. They uh, often talk about how it's a, a generational divide. They're all kind of lean towards uh, 40s, 50s. And so mm -hmm. th the interesting thing about Norm is that he is like an older school man of the left yes. that where in that time period, the kind of sector of cancellation was sectioned off to a very, very small amount of people. But in the younger generation, it, it seems to be like an end in it of itself. So maybe like a piece that would not match your guys's vibes or aesthetics would be like why we should cancel so and so <laughs> yeah but like yeah. the theory of leninism like that right. that maybe there's an elegant way to put that right right <laughs> right i mean certainly you know that i <laughs> i probably I don't, I don't know if i would run you know that many of those pieces or like you know that's yeah. not really my but it's like no like you know uh i let you know nothing uh human is alien to me that's how I like to think about the philosophy of the magazine. And so it's like, uh, yeah. So any, any anything serious and well-written and in good faith um, should come across. Now, at the same time, I don't feel shy about saying that, like, it's, it's certainly more right-wing than, like, most magazines that you'll pick up at the newsstand, right? And I, I suppose that has to do with, this philosophy right because i think most um most avowedly left-wing magazines don't share this philosophy it, it's right and um i want to come back to chesterton but first i want to ask you on that point you grew up reading the new york review of posts of, of books and and there is such excellent writing like there the new yorker yeah. the new york times washington yeah. post uh, occasionally my la times and la review books london review books like these major prestige places do you still read them do you still find value in them and i ask this because my last guest one of my last guests um richard hananiah he had this whole piece and thought that like it's really good to create these spaces where we're able to critique the prestige places yeah. but they still kind of get a lot right so i'm wondering if if this is still in your reading diet because great writers are obviously also great readers mm -hmm. much less so but really honestly because i run a magazine full-time and once you start to run a magazine full-time you stop wanting to read other magazines for fun mm -hmm. so much uh so i mean it re really as an experiment what i should do is just you know go to barnes and noble and you know read uh every you know all of these uh periodicals cover to cover you know and do that for a couple months and sort of you know that i could actually get a great piece out of that probably um there's no there's still good stuff and then there's a lot of shit. i mean <laughs> <laughs> Uh, That's right. The abundance. We have an abundance of yeah. Of I mean, I think you can still often find kind of uh, interesting literary criticism in in these places. I mean, um, that is sometimes gets like siloed, you know, and it's just like it is what it is. I mean, but I mean, I tend to find the political discussions in these publications, you know, not even bad but just boring because i just feel like um uh, i don't know how to i just feel like m my analysis tends to like be more to use a um a much misused word radical right like mm -hmm. i tend to want to go deeper down toward the roots and you know a lot of a lot of the political analysis will be is like well like you know it's sort of like arguments about like you know should i be a left liberal or a far left you know like <laughs> you still be far left but be against um you know like punching nazis you know just like it's just stuff that i find that tend to find quite tedious um whereas like what i would actually like to read is like Okay, somebody like write me something really strong, like explaining 
why like you still care about Marx. You know, I feel like ironically that stuff tends to be missing. Although, you know, maybe there's some great stuff that I just haven't seen. I can't claim to yeah there was a guy uh in that kind of um brooklyn communist circle who yeah. passed away <clears throat> in 2020 which is around the time that i uh i found him and that was michael uh yeah michael brooks he he wrote like a, a thing is called against the dark web and it was like mm -hmm. against the kind of uh major figures which have had their own splits and it's interesting because it reminds me of an idea you were talking about earlier the potential perils of audience capture when you rely upon right. the masses and right. i've seen these accusations between for example the fifth column who i like but then they make that kind of accusation against tucker because he's been so against the prestige press lately that they think he's gotten too conspiratorial in in the dark website you see like brett weinstein and sam harris attacking each other on other like mutual friends of theirs shows and both accusing each other of audience capture, the accusation against Sam Harris that he's been uh, captured by the kind of the ruling, the current ruling elite and, and right. wanting to, to hold on to whatever ounce of prestige he can have from them. And then uh, Brett Weinstein <laughs> seems to have shifted all the way uh finally right of center although he yeah. would describe himself as having stayed in the same place and everything else um moving so yeah if you could uh that that really does remind me of that if there's anything more you had to say about audience uh capture otherwise i want to take a recommendation for you on chesterton because i've seen mm -hmm. a million of his quotes and read them online but mm -hmm. i've never sat down and read any of his books and the kind of paradoxical tension that he presents is something like I'm a I'm I'm a deacon of the Orthodox Church and an MMA fighter. Like people mm. people say that all the time right. with me. <laughs> right, right. Um, about audience capture, you know, the funny thing is they're probably both right. You know, I mean, it's a very real thing, and uh, and you can feel it happening to you. Uh, you know, I'm not immune to it. I don't think anybody is. I try to fight against it to the degree I'm able. Um, but yeah, I mean, that just goes back to the point about patronage and, you know, like, um, you know, art and and great writing is inefficient. It's 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 not something that can be um, streamlined to to please your audience as much as possible. Right. You need to have the ability to. Um, say something that will you know lose you a ton of followers as it were right in order to be a a real a real thinker and a real writer um as for chesterton i love both um heretics and orthodoxy which are nice. just two books of essays uh and opposite in meeting although in a way they're very similar <laughs> because they're just uh you know like um in Heretics, he has a, uh, an essay called On Sandals and Simplicity, which is why he's against, you know, the simple life. Um, Amazing. So, so, you know, they're all, they're kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the original hot takes, right? And so, um, you know, Heretics is just focused on things he doesn't like, and Orthodoxy is focused on things he does like, but, you know, in order to describe the things he does like, he has to talk a lot about the things he doesn't like. So I'm, I can, I'm gonna you know, check those out. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, check those so out you, and I hope. If you read Heretics and you don't care for it, you, you know, you won't like Chesterton. Um, but you know, if you do, then there's there's much else to read. And then I'm a big fan of the Father Brown mysteries, uh, which is like he wrote oodles and oodles of these detective stories where the protagonist is sort of like um a rather homely, um, bumbling Catholic priest named Father Brown. Very interesting. And set in England? Um, yeah, for the most part, yes. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I would I would definitely that would write <laughs> yeah, that would yeah. be right up uh that would be right up my alley. Um one of my favorite artists that were not my favorite artists was within the Wu-Tang affiliate, Killer Priest. And I have a friend who's been on my show a couple of times. Big, he's a bigger Killer Priest fan than me. He always jokingly calls me Killer Deacon. And if I ever do 
<laughs> make it up to the priesthood. Those type of detective novels, I'm sure, would um, be really cool. If it's anything like Sherlock Holmes um, or something. Yeah, like Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can tell he's yeah he's it's like he's influenced by that, but he's putting his own um, spin. You know, yeah, his own spin. It's in in a way actually. It's I wonder if he's sort of trying to do the inverse of Sherlock Holmes because I think he you know he's very anti. Um, well, this is an overloaded term, but anti-rationalist, right? Anti, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. No, a good uh, few friends of mine um, describe self-describe ourselves as sort of pre-rational, and so. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I know <laughs> what you mean. I know. Yeah, yeah. which is different than like yeah. post-rational. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, for sure. On uh going back to the mars review of books you have um this wonderful series that is available also in the uh, digital earthling version as well which yes. are the bedside table series where you, oh, you like to, those i like those a lot oh, and i'll tell you yeah. my best friend other than when i go physically in his house and can see his books and he probably has like hidden books he calls it like uh there's a phrase i forgot what it is it's like brain leakage or something where he's like super protective and like me, his best friend and his wife both probably don't know all the books and things that he reads. Like, and he keeps it to himself because he says it's like showing your hand in poker or or letting people know your right. your chess strategy. Right. Um, but where, but but I really like that because you get to peek into different people who you respect. I I have been familiar with Default Friend and Alex Perez. You introduced me to is it Ellie Lynch? I've only read it. Sorry, I haven't heard her name. Mm. Um, and I found I found their their book selections fascinating. Well, Ali Lynch actually is the one who came up with this idea. So shout oh. out! To, um, you know, she she was working with me at the Mars Review for a little while, and uh, it's her idea. And yeah, she's the most recent one. Our, we're going to have Magdalene Taylor next. I don't know if you know Magdalene, but I saw that she was on the panel with you, but I wasn't. Yeah. As, she was with the her and the host was it Sam Frank were the ones I didn't yeah. know as much. I knew you. I've met. Uh, dt in person i'm not sure if i've met lomez but i i'm familiar with lomez as well i i have i i have the unqualified re reservations print book right signed edition <laughs> oh nice nice yeah yeah magdalene's got a sub stack i think it's just her name magdalene taylor dot sub stack worth checking out um she wrote in um our most recent issue of the mars review this is you know i really like these types of reviews because it's like it's this book where I don't think anybody, I don't, I didn't see any other real reviews of it. Um, it's called Silicon Valley Porn Star. But actually, I think, you know, the title should have been Silicon Valley Porn Addict. And it was about this, um, you know, quite successful uh, founder, you know, PayPal Mafia, and his struggles with porn addiction and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so so Magdalene is always right is often writing about you know um, our weird relationship with sexuality and you know sexual imagery in in the twenty first century and she's an astute analyst of that and so you know it's like there's so many books these days right so like a book comes out and it's like well it's like you know the book comes out gets nice blurbs. Um, and it's a good publicity vehicle for the author and it's like on to the next thing and uh you know the point of a review is to be like hey let's stop like what is this thing yeah. actually saying like what are the ideas in it like so i you know i'm not sure anybody else has given it a serious review and uh, I, I really liked what she wrote I'll, i'm gonna have to look into that because it's a very fascinating subject that you know especially it's of interest to people um in the church and anyone on the internet has seen yeah. you know a new words enter the lexicon lexographers like me will appreciate things like coomer and goonie and <laughs> this new internet language that people are talking about so anything that is sort of uh describing or critically thinking about that phenomenon is is very important and i'm sure that it cuts very broadly across the the populace do you do you have a recommendation for someone to start reading the mars review of books do you want them to go and read them chronologically or just go with what they feel or do you have a particular uh volume you have four volumes right out that you or yeah that you'd say yeah uh, yeah i mean i would say subscribe at marsreview.org and read from the beginning definitely um you know that's actually the only way you can um 
read read everything because issues one and two are sold out and issues three and four are pretty close to being sold out um but yeah i mean i think a lot of people see it because they know of one writer who you know they like and they see they're mm -hmm. in the large view but yeah i really i have to say not to like toot my own horn but like please do um you know there's this story about tolstoy who you know as you probably know like became very religious in his later life although he wasn't in his earlier life and he sort of renounced the writing of, of fiction and even the reading of it as being you know of questionable morality but like one day he um he sort of gave in to temptation and and he pulled a book off the shelf you know his voluminous bookshelves and started reading and you know started somewhere in the middle and read 10 pages and 20 pages and 30 pages and he said hey like you know, literature is not all bad like this is pretty good <laughs> like uh who wrote this and then yeah. the cover and it was Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy amazing <laughs> so like you know I do I have these boxes lying around that have like the few remaining issues of issues one and two and I'll pick it up and I'll be, you know read them and like hey like this is really interesting like this is like much more interesting to me than like the average like magazine that I would pick up off the shelves. I'm like, yeah, of course, like I find it interesting. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and sometimes you're in a different headspace where the same thing yeah. um, hits you differently. One of the things I'm doing on my Substack is um, I first learned how to read in the, my first spoken language, Amharic, the language of Ethiopia, when I was um, in my early 20s and the the whole impetus behind it was i had my grandfather who had written a memoir he died in 95 i knew him as a kid but you know not really um i could always understand the language so i'd beg my parents to read it to me and mm -hmm. they refused and uh, my mom is not as good at it my dad is like one of the most excellent readers of the language and there's even like one of my aunts who's not that good who, who used to read books to her and i was always like dude i'm your son why don't you read this book to me and it was this weird kind of forbidden fruit thing that they made me get after it. So I read it at that time, but I was much weaker in terms of understanding, but I, I was fluent, so I got through it. And I'm rereading it now and sort of like republishing it and even translating portions on my Substack. And totally like same thing, same physical product, but I'm in a different space in my 30s than I was in my 20s. So uh, yeah, <laughs> obviously you like your own curated work, but even I think in a different time frame, you come at it weirdly. Like I read my writing from like 2014, and uh, I think I was a uh, very uh, verbose, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> very bloviating, and yes. uh, using all like I was reading uh, Ludwig von Mises. He had words like apodictic all over. <laughs> his, his, uh, I had words like that all over. Yeah. I still think the good like the ability to send somebody to the dictionary is good. I remember rereading uh, Orwell's Animal Farm, which I had read in middle school. I, re I read it like a year or two ago, but like again, to just get back into it. And because it's in a rural farm setting and I'm such a city boy, there were actually a ton of words that sent me to the dictionary that mm -hmm. were like words you would know if you grew up on a farm, but that a city boy would be foreign to. And I was like, wow, I, I appreciated Orwell even more, which is, you know, it's obvious that he's good. But like, I was like, okay, hats off to you, man. Yeah, um, I gotta go back and read those as well. I also haven't read since since school. grade school. Have you read same, any of them? Same with 1984. So I yeah, gotta, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you'll take away something um, new from it. Actually, the next one I want to read because um, a friend, another friend who has uh, been a, a friend of my show and a patron, he's on. Uh, he's got his own review of books, The Worthy House. If you know Charles Haywood, mm. he's uh, he's uh, super into expanding upon um, ideology in this point. And he's written and waxed poetically about everyone thinks America is either the Roman Empire or Roman Republic. He believes the better analogy is the Spanish Civil War of the early 20th mm -hmm. century, of which Orwell took part in yes. on the side of the lowercase r Republicans against uh, what some people call fascists, but really it's not. Um, I would argue for many different reasons, but whatever you call the Franco side. Yeah. Um, and so that like that's that's interesting to me so his like uh i think it's homage to catalonia that's one of the next on my list but i i, I need to go back and read 84 as well because it was just animal farm that i read recently 
Um, you also um, sell a tote bag. I, I'm an independent store aficionado, two of the first bookstores in LA. One is, um, one's in the Pasadena. Oh, you got it. Nice. It's not working because of my Yeah, phone. I know you got it. There you go. Yeah, you go. There, yeah I could see yeah. it. Just to um, tantalize. Yeah. Yeah. What, one is, a, I think the correct is Chevalier. Maybe uh, people would say Chevalier, but Chevaliers, which is in uh, Larchmont. Um, uh near melrose and then you have um i'm forgetting the name of it but there's another great one in pasadena they're two of the first independent bookstores in la i used to live by the last bookstore in downtown la and so i've always been into the tote bags that those yep. places have as a way of kind of supporting talk about how you had that like before you had this tote bag were you a tote bagger or was that another idea from someone else <laughs> uh, i had some tote bags for sure yeah I'm more of a backpack guy these days, you know, because sometimes it rains. But, yes. You know, don't just don't go out in the rain. Buy your Mars Review <laughs> tote bag. Uh, if it's raining, stay inside. And Live in a sunny place. <laughs> yeah. Move to LA. Exactly. <laughs> Easy. Uh, you you also have the the machine war. I haven't gotten to that one yet. Could you uh, plug the machine war and then again plug everything else as we uh, sort of close <laughs> out here? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, The Machine War is a short book I wrote. It's, I would say, a philosophical history of computing. And it also talks quite a lot about Urbit. I'd say it's an Urbit-centric philosophical history of computing. And, um, you know, I, I, I was learning as I was writing. And the one thing I'll say to plug it is, like, it's really worth thinking about how we've gotten to the uh, state of technology and computers that we're in right now. Like it, it wasn't um, foreordained, right? Like there, there are many branches that could have, that we could have gone on, you know? Um, many different ideas about what a computer is, what a computer should be used for, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, who is, you know, fed it as the, um inventor of the world wide web was you know just aghast at the idea of like images and videos right he was like no this is going to be a network for uh academics you know you put images on and you know like it, facebook <laughs> it's going to be complete chaos so it's re it's really worth reading that stuff in order to um widen one's imagination about you know what the future could be right so that's very interesting. In it, do you discuss then how some people kind of say like it only happened because of the government and the military spending and that sort of the desire for military technology? Uh, well, 100% um, the government, um, you know, led, certainly you know the birth of computers as we think about them today was a was a was a government funded project um it was a department called i believe darpa unless i'm getting that confused and um there was a very bright guy leading that department named lick litter and he was um you know he was really at the forefront of the, he was a very philosophical guy and he was at the forefront of the study of cybernetics and norbert wiener and all that stuff and he basically saw the future and everyone thought he was mad, but you know, he saw the future. He saw how important this was going to be. And then around the same time, you know, the great genius John von Neumann uh, had come to America and, you know, he was one of the great mathematicians of, of his age and he came to America and, you know, was helping out with the war effort. And uh, he got very computer built and basically, you know, built our first, you know, Kind of modern computer um and then yeah the, and the internet it's it's you know it comes out of it's basically the same thing it's a public private um uh partnership but um yeah i mean the idea that it was you know just like a business no i mean but in in, in a way you know what is a government but a business with a monopoly on violence, right? <laughs> Absolutely, and, and, and that's you know one of the things that makes um, America so great 
is that <laughs> they have taken like you see it in the Amazon show Hunters, which is about mm -hmm. hunting Nazis, and you see it in the Oppenheimer film, which was a great phenomenon last year, the way they incorporated all of the persecuted Jews. America incorporates Jews and Nazis and uses them <laughs> for her own benefit to make the internet better. Yeah. Like, <laughs> where else in the world can you see that happening? So I'll tell you, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Maybe this will be my closing <laughs> thing. So my grandfather worked on the Manhattan Project, and, my, and so I read that book um, that Oppenheimer was based on, and my big beef with it was we did not get enough Edward Teller. Edward Teller was also, Edward Teller, you know, was a real um, emigre Jew. He was the guy who invented the H-bomb and he was mm -hmm. in some ways Oppenheimer's nemesis and he was um, yeah. an amazing friendly, character. Friendly fire nemesis, right? Like Yeah, and they, yeah. Re they really kind of flattened him out um, because, you know, to have such an interesting uh, contradictory figure, you know, really would have... Um, stolen some thunder from Oppenheimer, who was also a fascinating guy. Yeah, the the film really portrayed it as, as uh, I think, I would, would love to see more of Teller, but they portrayed him as more kind of consistently pursuing the science wherever it takes. Right. And it kind of showed Oppenheimer to have, if not explicit communist links, like enough of soft links through his brother and loved ones where he didn't want to attack the USSR. That's how, it, at least in the film, is portrayed. I don't know how accurate yeah. that is in real life. No, I think that's very accurate. I mean, I think it's sort of the same. It's, it's like, uh, you know, he wasn't really, he was just thinking the same way everybody else was. You know, these are our allies. We're working towards the same goal. And then, you know, uh, 20 years later, that became um, taboo. But, um, yeah, I, there's a, I think it was Einstein. There's a great quotation about him from Einstein who said, like, you know, uh, uh, Oppenheimer's one great character flaw was he was in love with a woman who did not love him back, and that woman was the United States government. <laughs> that is a great line. <laughs> Noah, thank you so much for being on my Thank you, man. This is great. I, now I want to do a podcast just so I can have you on and <laughs> ask you questions about you know language and MMA and all kinds of stuff. I'm very curious. But another time. <laughs>